lighting. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> what did I do wrong? I'm sorry. <laughs> I will not confess. I'm <laughs> <laughs> my lawyer. So, I'm so perfect. So how have you been? Yeah. Good, not too bad, not too bad. I've <laughs> been traveling a lot. Yes. Good. Since the IBC in Geneva, when I saw you, what is that? All over the world. Good morning, everyone. It doesn't stop. Oh, it's. Uh, thank you. It's getting worse. I agree. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Absolutely. So thank you so much for joining us this morning. As you all know, this week provides us all with a unique opportunity to take stock of our progress on these 17 Sustainable Development Goals and take stock in particular on the role of the private sector, which we all know will be critical in achieving these goals. I'm Catherine Cheney, and in my role with DevX, which is a media platform focused on global development, I often focus on the role of the private sector and the kind of exponential thinking that we're going to need to achieve these goals by 2030. So we all know if that's going to happen, it's going to require going beyond business as usual. I know my panelists agree. And I'm thrilled to be joined by panelists that are examples of that. They're going beyond business as usual when it comes to answering the call for business leadership. I'll go ahead and introduce my panelists and the topic we're going to discuss about, and then we'll dive right in. And we hope you can all walk away from this panel with some actionable insights. We were talking about this year at the UN General Assembly and events on the sidelines. We need to be diving into how, not just talking about what needs to happen, but how it's being done and all act on that in order to reach these goals. So to my left is Jean-Christophe Flatten from Mars, Inc. Next to him is Kristalina Georgieva, CEO of the World Bank. Beside her is Arif Nakfi, founder and CEO of the Abraj Group. And last but not least, we have Andre Hoffman, Vice Chairman of Roche. Again, I really feel that each of these speakers represent the kind of leadership we're going to need for business to lead the way as a force for good, which, of course, we all know needs to happen if we're going to reach these goals. And in a lot of these conversations, we talk about how we need to go beyond corporate res social responsibility, beyond CSR, but we don't talk about how that's actually done. Uh, so all of my questions are really going to try and get at how are these leaders achieving operational and strategic alignment with the SDGs in hopes that you all, if you're not already doing it, can try and do the same. So I'd like to start, start with you, John Christoph. Um, you know, many of you may know Mars as the company behind your favorite candy bars. Mars developed some special SDG M&Ms that are on the scene here in New York. Um, but I've been really drawn to Mars this week because of the recent announcement of your Sustainable in a Generation plan, which is going to invest over a billion dollars over the next few years to tackle climate change. And I'd love for you to talk about Mars uh, beyond this plan. Give us a sense of how, as a privately held and principles-led company, you're able to launch initiatives like this one, but perhaps even more importantly, across your value chain, work on the kind of impact we need for the goals. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Good morning, everyone. Uh, to the concrete question about how are we approaching that, I would say Mars is approaching that both as a duty and as an opportunity. The, the first point is about the duty. Why do we need to do that? And the answer is simple. The world is being reset around us, and the clock is ticking. Whatever stakeholder I talk to is requiring a different accelerated approach. I talk to my customers, and they expect us to show accountability for the entire value chain. Mm -hmm. We listen to consumers and the time for value for money is over. People are expecting values for money and questioning and challenging us for that. I'm listening to our own associates and they expect us to take ownership for the how we do business, much beyond the what or the how much. Mm -hmm. And finally, thinking of future talents, mm -hmm. the subject of the how we do business and which impact and how do we measure it is forefront of all conversations. So there is a very timely, a very sense of urgency, duty to reset ourselves. Mm -hmm. But I talked about opportunity as well, because I think this provides a unique opportunity to reinvent ourselves. Mars is a family-owned, privately-owned company, and we are, I'm not, but we are 106 years old. <laughs> 106 years old is not a chance, 
mm. does not happen by coincidence. It's not a fancy product or a lucky economic cycle that drives you through 106 years old. It's a series of permanent reinvention that brings you to be contemporary year after year, decade after decade, era after era. And therefore, what's at stake in this opportunity is to reset ourselves. What do we have for that? We are privately owned, and we are a principle-led business. So the concept of mutuality is not new to Mars. It was actually codified in a very nice typed memo in 1947 by Forrest Mars Sr. And the title of the memo was very simple. The objective of our business is to create a mutual benefit for all stakeholders. 1947. And the rest of the memo were bullet points where Forrest was listing all the stakeholders he had in mind. And you could say, yeah, he probably talked about associates, customer, suppliers, absolutely. But he was already talking about customers, competitors, mm -hmm. and communities. So it's not a new concept for us. It's not something we embraced 18 months ago because it was sexy or trendy. Mm -hmm. However, the demand is on us Think: what does it mean, mutuality in the 21st century? And I know you were very clear setting your expectation, Catherine, saying, give me some tangible how-to. So what does it mean concretely? The first how-to, you mentioned it, is the sustainable in a generation plan. We just communicated two weeks ago, which is a broader and accelerated commitment of what we want to achieve in terms of sustainability. Creating, accelerating a business that will be fully sustainable in one generation around contributing to a healthy planet, thriving people, and nourishing well-being. Backed up, because these are not words, these are actions with measures and resources behind that. This is business. It is not a 4 p.m. parallel agenda. It is the business agenda. We are, I am, measured on those indicators. So we try to take the best of science because the knowledge is compelling. Data is out there. It's robust. We are probably the first generation of senior leader who won't be able to say we didn't know. Mm -hmm. We know. Mm -hmm. So the question is not if. The question is how and how quickly. So this is one how-to. And the last or the second how-to is talking about how I talked about reinvention and resetting. So it's a very humbling opportunity and duty as well to reinvent the way we do business. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we are also working on business model innovation, leadership thinking innovation, with what we call economics of mutuality. We are very lucky to have an internal think tank within Mars called Catalyst. And 10 years ago, this think tank was provoked with a strange question. What is the right level of profit? Mm -hmm. How much profit should we make? And they wonderfully took that provocation and expanded the thinking by saying that only by looking at broader ecosystems, only by broadening the measures beyond financial capital or financial capital return, bringing on the table natural capital, social capital, human capital into our dashboard, would we be able to make progress? And this thought provocation, whilst the foundation of a great book, is brought to reality. We have more than 50 case studies running in our business about that. But don't we'll get to that. Hold the floor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, I want to actually hand it over to Andre at the end there. Um, since we, we were talking a little bit before we took the stage about what it means to be a family-owned business and how that impacts short-term versus long-term thinking. So um, for the sake of time, I'm going to roll two questions into one for you, Andre. And the first is, can you talk about, um, as a family-owned company, you know, what that means in terms of how you're able to operationalize on the SDGs? And then secondly, you know, obviously Roche is doing 
very important work on the SDGs as it relates to health through medicines and diagnostics. But uh, you're also, for the ninth year in a row, I believe, the most sustainable healthcare company in the world. So can you talk about your work on sustainability as well as health and how you actually see them as related? Well, th thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. F two things I want to say immediately. First of all, I'm absolutely overjoyed to hear what, you, what, what Marcel just told us. I mean, this is so much a, a, a wonderful case of how uh, a long-term family thinking type of business can influence uh, the process of value creation. I'm delighted to hear that, and I will tell you more about what we do at home. Secondly, I'd like to thank the, the, the technical staff of the forum. Thanks to you, I now know what it feels like to be a rabbit in the headlights of a car. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just about to be driven over by you, it's a bit, a bit of a strange thing. Anyway. Uh, uh, yes, you are right. We, we work with SDG free. We are, you know, pro providing people with health and well-being seems, be, seems to be an important issue. And it's, impo it's a, of course, a health for all is what, we, what is our business purpose. That's, that's what we do. We, we try to um, bring new therapeutic solutions to unmet medical need. And I will, go, I will come back to that a little bit later. You know, most of this week has been focused on the Sustainable Development Goal, and um, they are a wonderful instrument, and I'm delighted they exist, uh, because they allow us to sort of uh, measure ourselves to, to a set of, of, of conditions. But I would like to stress, and you know, 1947 is the date I just heard from Mars, I would like to stress that family businesses have already applied these principles for a very long time. When we take decisions, we take decisions in an intergenerational way. We want our next generation to, to succeed us, and in order to do that, there must be a healthy and, and competent business there. Healthy is perhaps not the right adjective in my case, but I mean, it, there needs to be a business there. A and um, you cannot do that if you do not con take into consideration not only the financial part of the, of, the, of, of the operation, but also the societal and the environmental. So, we welcome the SDGs because since 2015 we report according to them and suddenly we can tell our story in a way that everybody can understand, in a way that will make it common currency with other businesses um, and, and that I think is, is, is very useful. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, mm -hmm. which exists since 15 years, which is uh, uh, compiled by a small Swiss bank called um, uh, Sustainable Asset Management, which has now been acquired by Dow Jones and Robico and um, they publish once a year a sustainability index. We have been, for the ninth consecutive years, voted sustainability champion for the pharmaceutical industry. Now, again, if I can draw on what you were saying before, um, this is not a fluke. It's just, it did not just happen because we answered the question right. Nine years out of an, of an award that only exists in 14 years is quite a significant proportion. Now, why is that sort of thing important for us as a company? It's because we are a hybrid model. We are family controlled, principle led, but we are, um, w w sorry, principles led, not when we go back to principle later, uh, but, but we are quoted on the stock exchange. Um, in, in, in Switzerland, um, two types of paper are quoted. Uh, one is the shares, of which my family owns the majority, and the other is a dividend certificate, what we call, uh, I think, non equity security, NES not a very nice word, but there is no equivalent somewhere else on the planet. So that allows us to, uh, to, to control the long-term uh, destiny of the company, but at the same time, it forces us to a certain amount of transparency and to a certain amount of uh, advocacy towards the, uh, the, um, the non-voting equity securities uh, owners. So we have this model where we can satisfy, on one side, the stakeholders, number one, which are... Um, well, number one is not the, the, the right word. Let's say uh, the family stakeholders, and then the second part would be the non-family uh, sta uh, stakeholders who are the shareholders of um, uh, quoted on the stock exchange. So we have to satisfy about, I don't know, 20,000 analysts, while at the same time satisfying this long-term vision of somebody who wants to be around in the future. So b this has... Um, has not been easy, and um, uh, it, it's been over the years uh, an exercise which has been greatly facilitated by the Dow Jones Sustainability Index and by the SDGs. And that's really the point I wanted to make here. Now, <clears throat> we were talking about the list of stakeholders. Maybe I can start by, with our own list. Um, first and foremost, our employees. Um, we, we have an instrument where we measure satisfaction of our employees. It's called the GEOS. I'm sure a number of companies in the room do the same thing where we send an opinion poll to our employees uh, twice a year, 
and we ask them to rate how they feel about our business. And to the question, are you proud of the company? We have regularly over 85%. To the question, are you proud to be working for the company? The same numbers. To the question, do you think your company uh, is, is treating employees and the environment fairly? We get again 86% last year. So, to a certain extent, I'm quite convinced that this um, perception of a sustainable business has stuck. Our workforce, our, our co-workers uh, consider this as an important asset of the company and that's particularly uh, visible in the young generation and, and I'm sure we will have an opportunity to, to come back to that again. Um, the, 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 there's a little, uh, a little uh, footnote to this, which I find interesting. It is the long, um, the, the conviction of, that long term matters mm -hmm. is better understood by long time serving employees than by young employees. Young people, find, young recruits to our, to our uh, company find it very important that we behave responsibly, but the true understanding of what long term means come only after a certain amount of years in the business. And um, the, the way we try to develop this, is this attitude is by talking about principles, you know, the principles expressed by the principles. And we, you know, I, I, I represent a family on the board of the company and I spend a lot of time um, making this sort of presentation, talking about uh, sustainable values and how we can harmonize them in the long term. And I must say, it is watched over not only by our investors, but it's also watched over by our future employees. We, 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 are, we have skin in the game in that context. Uh, <clears throat> maybe you ask me a practical way of how you can convince employees to, to, uh, to, to build into this. I would quote three things. I mean, financial intensive always works well. Uh, um, SDG 5, um, promoting women. Uh, our bonus in the, top, uh, in the top 100 salary is calculated on the amount of women uh, promoted within the industry. So within, within the company, sorry. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, I see there's just one person clapping. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, we, we also um, incentivize on the individual uh, um, energy footprint of the, of the members of the staff. So um, I can give an example. Over the last um, 10 years, since we are in this uh, systematic approach of sustainability, we have, re we have constantly invested into producing energy or using energy more efficiently and we now have, a, a, it, it represents a, um, a lowering of our costs of about 150 million dollars a year. And if you put that in a long time scale, it's win-win. It's not win-win instantly, but it's win-win in the long term. Um, I can go on for a long time. That's good for now. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I really appreciate your point about principles expressed by the principles, not to confuse things further, but um, I think it is critical that you set an example in this way, and of course, incentives matter too, so it's helpful to get the step-by-step -step as to how you did it. Yeah. Um, so, RF, I want to ask you, um, you know, one of the things you really push for is what you term partnership capital. So, I think it would be helpful for this audience, um, both in the room and online, to hear what do you mean when you say partnership capital, and why is it so critical that we talk about and think about investment in these terms? Sure, thank you. Uh, it's not just a, a concept plucked out of the air. Partnership capital is actually at the heart of how the world of finance can enter into a broader spectrum of stakeholder engagement. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the way we look at partnership capital is, I, you know, from the perspective of the financial services industry, we're not a family-owned firm, but the reality is that when you manage 10-year, 12-year capital, then the financial services industry calls that long-term, okay? And that gives you an idea of the difference between the value that is created by being in the private sector, by being under family ownership, and by being under the scrutiny of um, fiduciaries and external investors. And so I think it's very important to put out there in perspective that when we evaluate our own thinking in relation to what role we play in the world of finance, we came up with a very clear understanding that we as a firm live in 
what the world calls emerging markets. We think that's a mistaken term. It's actually probably uh, better to use the term growth markets because using the term emerging markets is a little bit patronizing. China, as an example, has already emerged um, and, and so deserves the right to be looked at in isolation, just like uh, the United States and um, other major um, economic blocks. But when you, when you look at our markets and you look at the fact that opportunity abounds in those markets, and yet there isn't as much capital flowing to those markets. Um, and then we stop to think of ourse to ourselves, there's a lot of capital out there, and there's a lot of opportunity out there. And most of it can be cloaked in the context of um, what we are now beginning to call impact investing. But the reality is that in that part of the world, because development is such a key priority, you need to be investing with purpose at the same time. So we call all of that collectively partnership capital because different stakeholders are involved in this process and different formulations can be applied into how um, capital is deployed and, and returns are generated. But you know the most interesting thing that I find when I look at um, economic opportunity in those markets is that we're not facing up to one reality. We love talking about uh, meeting the sustainable development goals. We love talking about impact investing. And yesterday there was an event that was co-sponsored by Bank America, uh, Merrill Lynch, Jin, and us, in which it was surprising that you know there were 450 people turned up. And all of a sudden you realize that there's an inflection point, a tipping point that is happening that seems to have been passed. More and more people from the private sector, more and more people from the world of finance are beginning to realize that this impact investing thing is not the ambit of governments, it's not the ambit of NGOs, and necessarily you do not have to compromise on investment returns to generate decent capital returns mm -hmm. in order um, to do good as well. So what we see is against the backdrop of all of that, we're addressing all of those issues because that is the ambit of government, but what is the ambit of the private sector is the way capital flows, and we have to understand that the plumbing in the global financial system, in my opinion, is a little bit broken, right? And why that plumbing is a little bit broken is if you think about it, we have, <coughs> excuse me, we have about $9 trillion, $9 trillion of money sitting in negative yielding instruments, debt instruments. And $9 trillion in negative yielding debt instruments actually means that as fiduciaries, we are willing to accept the guarantee of making losses, right? Now, the last time I checked, that's not what we're all in business for when we're in the financial services industry. We are not there to guarantee making losses. And at the same time, the world is facing a, another very interesting reality, which is that since 2007, um, cross-border capital flows have gone down 65%. Okay, that's a massive number. It's gone from 23% of global GDP down to 6% of global GDP. So we're not collaborating either, okay? And a large component of that comes from our non-holistic evaluation of risk. We don't look at risk in anything other than mathematical formulaic terms. And the reality is we look at it in a very erroneous fashion. So when people look at investing in impact, as an example, they feel there's a trade-off between uh, making returns and doing social good. I challenge that. I say there's no trade-off, there's actually a trade-on mm -hmm. because you can actually accomplish an enormous amount of positivity. You can get the economic returns as well. You don't have to compromise on the investment returns. And then when you take that thinking a little bit further and you start focusing on the scale and breadth of that opportunity and the, and the fact that we're all focused on risk being so much greater in those markets, well, you know, I'd like to point out something that we were talking about before we started, which is that the default rate on projects in North America is 8.7%. The default rate on projects in Africa is 1.1%. Mm -hmm. And that's not accidental. That is because, and that's a reality, because projects happen to be better constructed and happen to have a greater focus on execution in parts of the world where we would not think that it existed. So when we look at the sustainable development goals, and we think about the fact that we have a two to three trillion dollar need to meet the sustainable development goals. The Business and Sustainable Development Commission put out a report where just to accomplish um, the meeting of four goals over the next decade and a half to two decades, we have uh, an economic investment need 
of $12 trillion. Where is this money going to come from? It can only come from the private sector. It cannot come from government. Governments create the enabling environment. And for the private sector to understand that the returns can be generated without the compromising, um, or the, the returns don't get compromised whilst achieving good outcomes, this is critical. And that is why businesses like us, that for the last 16 years since I started the firm, um, have always focused on investing with impact. Mm -hmm. And the question is now, more and more people are saying you need to invest for impact. And I think that's a dichotomy that does not necessarily need to be drawn because at the end of the day, um, I think impact is a partnership-driven term. Thank you. I, I want to get your take on this, Kristalina. Um, you know, I know one of your big goals is to remove the barriers for the private sector to invest. And yet, you do face challenges there because not everyone in the world thinks the way some of our fellow speakers on stage think, right? They're on board with the SDGs. They're thinking every day how to make leadership decisions that advance the SDGs. But not all business leaders do. So can you talk about how do you remove those barriers and what are you learning along the way that could help this audience? Well, thank you very much for having us all here. Um, I, uh, I thought that I'm representing an old institution, and then I learned, no, we are only 72 years young. I, mean, yeah. I am much older. Uh, nonetheless, nonetheless uh, of course, we live in a world that is changing very rapidly, and we all have to, to, to uh, adapt and anticipate and actually preempt uh, the uh, negative impacts of this change. So what, what do we do? I, I should tell you, before we came in the room, we were instructed by Catherine that we cannot talk about what we could do, would do, should do. We can only talk about what we do do. <laughs> Thank you. So here is, my, here is my list, what we do to remove barriers to investors to be the matchmaker between the money sleeping with low or even negative return and the opportunities in developing countries. Four things. One, we work very hard on policies in countries that are making it easier for domestic private investors and for capital from coming from abroad to flow in. We used to do this as our public sector engagement with very little uh, awareness of what the private sector arm of the World Bank does. No more. We work together so our understanding of what is that is on the way of investment to happen is grounded in reality of possible or desirable investments. So this uh, opening up markets, creating markets by building a policy environment for private investors, absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. And that we try to do in a way that creates competition among countries to do better. Many of you may have heard of the Doing Business Report of the World Bank. Uh, how many know what it is? Raise your hand. Well, OK, so I'll, I'll tell you. This is something that basically measures uh, uh, investment conditions in countries in a very practical way. And it shows countries that are improving and countries that are actually going down. Uh, in my professional life, I have enjoyed uh, the bank being praised, and I have you know, heard the bank being criticized. One of my best moments was sitting in St. Petersburg and listening to President Putin and, President and Prime Minister Modi talking about where they are on doing business and how they're going to go up. And I certainly hope they do go up. But this is very important that we create pressure through peer competition for conditions to improve. Second, there, is, uh, there are some very clear obstacles to investments. For example, educated people, lack of infrastructure. So we we'll work on identifying these bottlenecks, and then we target our own investments to address those. And I and I'm very proud to say that we recognize one of the huge uh, loss 
opportunities is uh, countries not advancing enough on gender equality. So when we work on education, it is boys and girls to be in school. When we, when we work on, on access to financing, it is for men and women. Uh, and I think that, that this, uh, even in, in difficult countries, produces, produces uh, desired results. So very important to recognize that the, uh, the physical and human capital, human environment in countries is what makes it or breaks it for investments. Uh, three, we relentlessly innovate for you to make it possible for your investments to bring sustainable uh, outcomes. For example, uh, in 2007, I think it was, we issued the first green bond. Uh, today, we have an issuance of, of 10 billion IFC, IBRD, but the green bond issuance globally is what, 100 plus billion? And of course, we don't stop there. Now we have issued a SDG bond. Can you put your money knowing that it contributes in a measurable way to the SDGs? We issued the first ever pandemics bond. After Ebola, we said, this is horrible for investors. You don't want to be in a situation when you invest and a pandemic wipes out what you have done. So we put together a bond, it get, pandemics bond. It guarantees that the poor, poorest people in the poorest countries will have the risk of pandemics shared by the market. And surprisingly, we raised, it is a 550 a million. Surprisingly, it was twice oversubscribed. And I want to put a little uh, uh, footnote on this. It shows that there is really appetite for investing in something that is bringing you uh, income, but it is also doing good in the world. And uh, uh, that takes me to my, to my last uh, point and very important point. We are now getting into institutional discipline. We call it cascade. We look at every single opportunity to invest in a developing country and we say, can that be done by the private sector on its own? Yes, no. If yes, don't touch. There was time when the World Bank would pick up these kinds of investments. Why? Second question, if it cannot be done, why? What is the barrier? And then can we eliminate it with policy change? Or three, is it necessary to put a guarantee? And please remember that now, much more than before, we are there to pick up the first uh, loss for you. We have a private sector window for, em for the most uh, uh, <laughs> risky markets where there is a grant component to bring the risk for private investors down so investors can happen. Uh, and, and of course, for if, if none of this can happen, private sector cannot do it, barriers cannot be removed, and yet it is crucial investment, then we would do it. We would make sure it is, it is being funded. Let me finish with uh, a, a very important observation from, I mean, I am not as old as the, as the World Bank, but I'm coming close, I realize, uh, out of my own life. In the 70s, uh, I lived in Bulgaria, my home country, at that time, it was on the other side of the Iron Curtain. And we had, for the first time in our lives, foreigners from the West visiting my university. They happened to be Japanese. Bulgarians are incredibly hospitable people. So we treated them with everything we had. And of course, a lot of red wine, which led to one of them, in the end of the evening, becoming very uh, sort of uh, uh, lightheaded and saying the following, you are lucky you don't know how poor you are, which was a big shock to me. I didn't know, I didn't think we were that poor. But that, the moral of my story is lucky no more. We live in a world where everybody knows everything about any place on this planet. And that means that aspirations are converging. Mm in countries across borders. 
if opportunities don't follow, we are going to have very, 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 very destable world. And so we are the first generation to live in this world of, of converging aspirations. We are the last that can match aspirations with opportunities. And it would only happen if this nine billion you're talking about go and work hard where they're most needed. It's so helpful to hear all these perspectives because I feel like you know a lot of terms are thrown around, especially during a week like this one where we're all talking about um, you know, some big ideas and how we get there. And one of those terms is billions to trillions, and the World Bank is working toward that. Um, but again, we, we don't often talk about how, and we were all hammering the how point home. And I think this gets to how and some of your responses, so I really appreciate it. Um, I know there are so many perspectives in this room that this conversation would benefit from. And I want to go ahead and um, call on one person. You heard earlier um, that Mars has taken a look at this question of what is the right level of profit, which I think is really interesting. And um, one of the leaders behind answering that question is actually Bruno Roche, sitting here in the front row. Um, so he's the chief economist at Mars, and um, I'd just love to hear from you, Bruno. The aim of this summit is to move from, you know, 10% impact to 10 times impact. And I know you've looked at how that works within Mars, and I wonder if you can share some insights with our audience. Well, thank you, Catherine. Thank you very much. Maybe I should stand up. And just to, to say that my simple answer to this is scale. And uh, yep. scale will come from the uh, private sector uh, and will come from the uh, business sector, but also the financial sector. And, uh, mm -hmm. and it is probably the unique contribution that the private sector can, can bring to, to this challenge. But not only that, it's scale and also the power and discipline of management. So when we apply the discipline of management to manage certain things, efficiency follows. And management is diagnostic. If you ask management to make profit, they will make profit. If you ask management to make other things, they will make other things. But if a business is, um, is going to be um, a force for good for society and the planet, it has to be true to the nature of that business. And business is about managing, mobilizing resources, very often scared resources, but also to deliver performance. And this has been the case all the time. It existed before financial capitalism, it will exist after financial capitalism. However, what has changed is that the, uh, the focus on financial performance for shareholders is no longer a winning strategy and is no longer a sustainable strategy to ensure that business will remain sustainable. So we must innovate. And we must innovate from a management perspective. So our business model must be completed in a sense. It doesn't have to be uh, changed all the time, but it has to be completed to deliver the uh, superior performance that our business needs and our actually at the world needs. So how? Well, eventually, management is very simple. It's all about measurement. So we need new metrics that go beyond financial mm -hmm. performance. Okay. And we need also to go beyond the traditional boundaries of the firm and to consider the performance of the business throughout the ecosystem in which we operate. So Jean-Christophe shared that we started this economics of mutuality journey 10 years ago with a very unusual question that what should be the right level of profit? So it was a wonderful endeavor. I mean, both moral endeavor and also very practical endeavor. So 10 years later, where we are today, well, eventually, we applied economics of mutuality across different parts of Mars. And we also learned from other businesses. And actually, the good news, yes, I agree with you, Arif. It is possible to deliver financial performance and to deliver positive impact in society. And this is not an accident. It is normal, because when you bring new resources to your business, and you manage them in a, with a more intentional way, you should expect additional performance. It is normal. But it's not only, um, it's not only a business experience, it's also an academic experience. And actually, Oxford joined us several years ago to provide the backing of this academic theory. So 
the work on economics of mutuality gives us great hope, actually, that what seemed impossible only a few years ago, actually, is now possible, yep. it is practical, and it is happening. And it's being And done. actually, it is not limited to, to family-owned business. Mm -hmm. Maybe the family-owned business provided environment that made it possible to test, but this has natural laws in business that we forgot, and we have to rediscover these uh, uh, natural laws. So what's next? That was your question. Well, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. This is an African proverbs. So what we will do, I mean, as a family-owned business, we will continue to invest in economics and mutuality. We will continue to apply economics and mutuality in different parts of Mars. We will continue to partner with Oxford to deliver and to improve the, finance, the management theory. But it's not enough, because Mars and Oxford can't change the world. So we look to partners. And we look to be, in a sense, a catalyst. This is the name, actually, of the organization that I lead. But a catalyst to nurture a movement in business and academia. And to facilitate this movement, actually, Mars has decided that if EOM, if economics of maturity, is really about uh, giving a chance to every business to uh, deliver financial performance, sometimes at a higher level than traditional business cases, while addressing the most pressing, the most difficult point in society, it should certainly be unethical and not mutual at all, actually, not share it with the others. So we are looking to share what, what we have uh, and also to claim no IP on what we have developed. So it's a movement that we want to initiate here, a movement of education and a movement of action. People perish because of lack of knowledge. And also, no change happen without implementation. So it's a movement that we called an education and action, but a movement actually to complete capitalism and as a way to heal business, to heal the world. I will finish with another quote actually, which one of my favorite singer, King Solomon, 3,000 years ago, said that there is a time for everything under the sun. A time to plant, a time to uproot, a plan to keep, and a camp to throw away, a time to stay silent and a time to speak. So now is a time. Now is a time. So scale, to go back to my initial question, mm -hmm. scale mm -hmm. uh, is what we need. Mm -hmm. And the private sector, both the business and the financial sector, can provide that scale, but it's not enough. It has to be coupled with a more complete business model that addresses not only the financial capital aspect of this economy, the social capital aspect, the human capital aspect, the natural capital aspect. And we need partners to create this paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. So I, I wonder, um, we, we started a bit late and don't have as much time as I would like for audience Q&A here, but is there anyone with a burning question that we have not gotten to in this discussion when it comes to answering the call and how you might go back to your businesses and act on some of these suggestions? If not, I always have a question. No one? So I suppose um, I, I'd like to hear final thoughts from each of you. Do we have someone over there? Oh, yeah, we do have someone. Go I was going to say, give them I a know. chance. First question doesn't come easy. Second question, uh, here There you is. go. <laughs> sorry, just to, I'm so sorry uh, to come in late. No I used to work for the United Nations until a couple of months ago on the SDGs. And I just think one remark has been said uh, this morning that ought to resonate really hard in everybody. Certainly, I, I am really uh, bowled over by it. And that's Kristalina Georgieva's point. She just said, uh, aspirations are converging. Mm -hmm. What are we doing about the opportunities? Now, this impact summit is a new thing. But it's a really powerful thing because it's bringing together business leaders and leaders in the international system in front of and together with world leaders in a slightly different way from what happens in other parts of the World Economic Forum. And this surely is the best place in the world for there to be a sense by the end of today that everybody who leaves this conference center ought to have burning in their head what am I going to do in the next few months 
personally to make sure that opportunities and aspirations start to converge. Because I think every one of us who works in the UN knows that that dichotomy is actually the most dangerous phenomenon in our world. And so although I think it's okay for us to be hearing individual experiences from individual companies which are heartwarming, there's a bigger problem at the moment, a real systems problem that we've really got to all focus on. And wouldn't it be great if by the end of tonight there can be a sense that this is our take-home project mm. and we're not going to rest until we've found ways in which we can get all our institutions, businesses, banks, international organizations to work just for that one thing, the convergence, the big convergence, without which our world is going to not be able to survive. Thank you. Can I just Thank make you. a very quick sure. point there? You know, it's fascinating what you're saying. And I think, con <clears throat> excuse me, I think convergence is happening despite ourselves, okay? So I think we always look at the negativity and what isn't happening right and so on. What we should also focus on is what is going well. Mm. And the reality is that it's actually convergence is being forced on us by the generation behind us, mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen. Yep. Okay? The millennial population on this planet, which is the most exciting element of what makes the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals possible, is they've got it instilled into their moral fiber. Okay? And it hasn't happened accidentally. It's happened because thanks to the advent of new technology, thanks to the advent of social media, they believe in a sense of community significantly more than the generation that largely is represented in this room. We grew up thinking about hierarchy and systems and United Nations and development goals and so on. They grew up thinking, how do we help each other? That social media community, which has really grown. And you know what? They don't interview um, we don't interview them when they come for jobs. They interview us, okay? Yeah. Absolutely. They actually focus on what our companies are doing to meet those sustainable development goals. They focus on why they should be working there. And I'll go so far as to postulate the following, that in a few years' time, every company is going to have to and is going to be forced to reflect these sustainable development goals for one simple reason. People will walk into supermarkets, see three bottles of water, on the shelf and they'll pick the bottle of water from the company that they know is doing stakeholder engagement, doing good, and is meeting the sustainable development goals. That's going to get the dinosaurs out of business anyway, okay? So the good news is, and again, it's what Klaus Schwab keeps talking about in terms of the fourth industrial revolution, the world is reinventing itself, people should be reinventing themselves, also thinking about what's behind us. And you know, a very famous 18th century poet said, procrastination is the thief of time. So the longer we hang around thinking about how to structure, it's already been done, it's being forced upon us, let's just move on. Thank you. Christina, you want to um, I, I very much agree that there is a um, change that is happening because of this connectivity and because of this ability to see uh, what is going on everywhere and understand a little bit your role in this. Uh, one of my colleagues here, we were talking about impact investing and um, we were saying, well, impact investing uh, is small, still small. Uh, and then he said, look, it's gonna be big very quickly because my kids are not gonna invest in anything that is not having positive uh, impact. But here is the the challenge to us, and we at the bank embrace it, and I hope we can, this is a partnership, it cannot be done by one organization alone. We have to be able to record impact, we have to be able to measure it, we have to be able to, to present it in a way that, that can, uh, can uh, marry money, money and impact. And I think we are a little behind uh, on uh, getting that uh, done. We are thinking at the bank that our, all, our whole energy, if we want to be the matchmaker between money and, and needs, our whole energy has to go on presenting the needs and the impact in a way that can be factored in decision, uh, in decision makers making. Uh, and it is possible, but I don't want to trivialize it. It is extremely difficult to do. 
and there is a huge risk, risk we fall for investing what we can measure, not because not what is really important. We fall for investing where we can measure, not where the needs are more most uh, dramatic. So with that caveat, kind of agree, but. Mm -hmm. uh, can I do my last closing one sentence, two sentences? Sure, because sure. I know you're, 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 you've got the moment going. Them. Go for I am, it. I, I am actually, I am actually uh, uh, more optimistic than I have mm. ever been in my life. Mm. Yes. Because what I see is this convergence, this synergy of policymakers, business community, citizens' engagement. It's actually happening. Uh, when I started working on sustainable development, there was a very popular story. How can we move to sustainable development? There are two options. One is realistic, the other one is fantastic. Mm. Realistic, extraterrestrials come from space, take over our affairs, it's done. Fantastic, we people do it ourselves. I think we are now at this tipping point when actually we are getting uh, on doing it. And I think we are getting on doing it because, frankly, we have no choice. I rest my case. Powerful. I hesitate to continue from there, but we must. Um, I'd love to hear from our other three speakers. I love the point about take-home projects. Um, so I'll often ask for calls to action, but I think that's even better, a take-home project for people watching online, for people in this room. Um, and better yet, if that take-home project can start to get at the system, because, of course, change is not going to happen just with individual actions by companies, um, though that's a, an important part of the, of the bigger system. Um, but Jean-Christophe, you want to start us off with a take-home project? Yeah, the, the take-home project would be based on uh, this is our time. And because this is our time, embrace the discomfort of measuring beyond the walls of your organizations. It brings challenges. Measures do not exist everywhere, as you said. It's uncomfortable at the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uncomfortable as leaders. New questions, new challenges, new provocations are being put on the table. New business vocabulary or book mm -hmm. needs to be brought to life. We are used to acquire. Perhaps we should learn to share. We are used to build. Perhaps we need to be better at leveraging. We are used at recruiting. Perhaps partnering should be a stronger place in our agenda. So my take-home project is embrace the journey of mapping your value chains, mapping your ecosystem beyond the walls of your company, accept the discomfort of the truth that yep. will come back, and accept, embrace the discomfort of bringing to life a different way of doing business because our kids are watching us mm. and we won't be able to tell them we didn't know. So let's stand up and do it in a way that shaped their future. Thank you. All right. Me? Um, you know, a couple of years ago, the Oxford Martin School came out with a report in which the headline was, this is the best time in history to be alive. And I looked at it and I was a bit bemused because I didn't have any other choice in history to be alive. This was the <laughs> time of my life. And as I've gone through my life, I figured out that I'm becoming more and more optimistic. And I'm beginning to become more and more aware of the fact that more and more people are thinking the same way. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that, you know, the United Nations came up with the Sustainable Development Goals, and it's actually quite remarkable because it is the first time they actually started speaking the language that the rest of us speak too. Mm. And those are 17 Sustainable Development Goals and the 169 subsets and whatever are actually clear action points. And if you think about, I come from the financial services industry, so I'll talk about that. If you think about the takeaway that comes from that, every single one of them are convertible into investment opportunity. And the financial services industry is now waking up to that. For too long, the word impact investing, the term impact investing, was taken up too much in debate of defining what impact is, how do you measure it, what do you do. And my takeaway from this point is, wake up, go out there and do things in a nice, sensible, proper way. You can never build a great company unless you start with a good company. And a good company stands for what society determines to be the right things out there. And the last point I wanted to make is that up until now, and I've been to many UNGA weeks in, in, in my life, and 
Gillian Tett from the Financial Times said yesterday that she always felt it was like two tribes going to war, right, w this week. It was the political community, which comes and talks about politics and war and conflict and so on. And you have the NGO community, which is saying, forget about all of that nonsense. There's a better thing to do out here. Well, this time, it's three tribes coming to work and talk, actually, whereas the business world is actually stepping up pretty actively for the first time as well. And I think that's very positive as a takeaway. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And um, Andre, I'd be curious to hear your take home project. And, you know, I don't know that we'll have time to get to this, but we were talking a little bit backstage about how um, you mentioned the three tribes, RF, and, and how business, when business is on board with doing good, can do so more efficiently than the NGOs. That's something we were discussing. So, Andre, any um, take home project for us, or perhaps just a comment on that point, which I know you're you strongly could get in. Into trouble with that response. Yes. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll watch it. Um, an enormous amount of things has been said, and we have even more things that we could be saying about this. This is a very complex, uh, so, so I will try to keep it very simple, very straightforward, uh, and I would like to say two things. Um, when you take investment decisions in your businesses, when you are embarking into new projects, when you're calculating in that present value, just think long term. Mm -hmm. It's an easy thing to say, it's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, the fact that we are constantly trying to bring back the payback date earlier has, is probably at the root <coughs> of the problem which we are. We were talking about the broken plumbing of finance. It's much more than that. It's a broken model of development. The system needs resetting. And the best way to resetting that system would be to think in a, in, in a long-term way. Um, is that simple enough to take home? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, that, that would be We've one. got our homework the, cut the, out. The, 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 the other one is, um, you know, making the world a better place, trying to uh, uh, have business as a force for good. Mm -hmm. um, all, all, all these, all these uh, mantras are certainly correct and we must push them as much as we can. Um, but I think it is very important and that's where the point of why businesses are more efficient at doing good. Um, it, it's, not, it's not how you spend money which is important, it's how you make it. Because a lot of people believe that because they are contributing to a philanthropy and because they are launching new projects which do not have a payback, they are doing the right thing. I contest that. I think the best way of doing a difference, of making a difference, of making the world a better place, is to invest in projects which have positive cash flows and which will go on having positive cash flow. All the rest is a failure in my view. Is so that I simple as well? Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. Thank you I, I want to close with this just because we're out of time and I know we, we could keep talking and I hope you'll come catch our speakers between sessions. Um, but yesterday at the private sector forum, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, said this to the audience gathered. And for those of you who didn't hear this message, I, I wanted to repeat it for you. Without your leadership, our project will simply fail. So I think if nothing else, that just indicates how high the stakes are when it comes to answering the call. And I hope that you all agree we've walked away from this panel with some actionable insights on how we can answer the call. So please join me in thanking our panelists.